Hey everyone, I'm Coach Shippies and I've been a professional top laner or head coach for the past 8 years. During this time I've reached Worlds and MSI multiple times. Now I'm a full time coach with a ton of passion towards helping players unlock their potential and climb to their dream rank. How's it going everyone? Today we're going to be covering everything you need to know about how to learn and master Gwen. Now the thing about Gwen is she is one of the hardest carry top laners in the entire game, however you need to know when to pick her. She's extremely powerful in the right situation, but if you pick her at the wrong time, she can be completely useless. So by the end of this card, not only are you going to learn how to play her, but you're also going to know when to use her. First up, we're going to be covering the runes, and runes are pretty straightforward on Gwen as you only have one page, and that is the Conqueror page. As Gwen, you want to be providing as much damage as possible for your team, and Conqueror is going to do just that. It's going to give you the most damage out of all rune pages, so I wouldn't play Gwen without it. And as for the runes in this tree, you're going to be running Prince of Mind. Now, this rune is mandatory because without it, you're going to feel a lot of mana issues, spamming QE in lane, clearing sidewaves. Eventually, you're going to run out of mana if you don't take presence because you're going to be using your Q very often on Gwen. It's got quite a low CD, so you definitely need to run Prince of Mind. And as for the second runes in this tree, you're going to be taking alacrity upwards of 90% of your games. Now, Gwen loves having attack speed, especially later on. Your E starts to do an insane amount of damage, but you can't really build attack speed other than Nash's Tooth. There's no real item you can build to give you extra speed past Nash's Tooth, so having as much attack speed as possible from your runes is going to feel quite nice. But of course, you will need to take Tenacity sometimes. If they have an absurd amount of crowd control, so let's say Sejuani Jungle, Amumu Support, then of course you can run Tenacity, but for the most part, if you need Tenacity, just build Merc Treads and run Alacrity, because you're really going to feel the difference between having it or not having it in terms of later points of the game. And as for the third rune, you're going to be taking Last Stand every game. Over the course of whatever 100 to 1000 Gwyn games, this is the rune that's going to give you the most damage by far, so I strongly recommend running it every time. And as for the secondary runes, you are going to be running the Resolve Tree every single game, and in this tree you're going to be taking the Coach Shippies Panted best rune in the game, and that is Demolish. Gwen is primarily a side laner, so you want to have as much threat as possible on these towers in the mid game, and especially in the early game. You're almost always, in every game you play, not every single game, but for the most part, reach a situation where you can hit the enemy tower. Even if you're losing lane, if they take a bad recall, anything like that, you're almost always going to be able to hit the tower, so Demolish is going to help you gain as much advantage as possible in terms of tower plates. And as for the second rune, you're going to be taking either second win or bone plating. Now, second wind, of course, is going to be in matchups where they take short trades. So champions like Gangplank, champions like Riven, even a Grass Fiora, second wind is going to be best. And then you're going to be taking bow plating versus champs that have to all into proc it. So champs like Jax, champs like Riven. However, if you're unsure which one to take, if they, if they're a champion like Fiora, for example, as a good example where Conqueror Fiora could all in you and, you know, hit multiple times, or she could just queue you and walk away, prop your bone plating. Of course, you should take second win. You should default to second win if you're unsure, but bone plating is going to be best in matchups where they're forced to all in you. And as for the runes, the orbs down the bottom, you're going to be taking attack speed, adaptive force, and either armor or armor, depending on your matchup. Our next one, we're covering summoner spells, and Gwen is quite unique in the sense that she does have a wide variety of spells to choose from, whereas most champions only have around 2 to 3, Gwen actually has 5, and I'll go through each spell in order of overall power, and the first spell is going to be Ghost. Now, Gwen does an insane amount of damage, but she can struggle with getting onto the backline, getting onto your opponent, and sticking onto them. So Ghost is going to scale the best in terms of team fighting and also in the side lane. You'll find more often than not, if you get 2 to 3 manned, Ghost is going to help you the most in terms of surviving and also the cooldown is a lot lower. So I strongly recommend taking Ghost in the majority of your Gwen games, but I will give the variables for when not to take it. And the second spell is of course going to be the classic teleport, and this is going to be your default setup, especially if you're just learning Ghost and TP together, where if you don't take TP, which is an option on Gwen, we'll go through the rest later, but if you don't take TP, you're setting yourself up to be a target for the enemy jungler, and also if you play the side lane in the mid game, there's a situation where let's say you just recall, you're going back to bot, and a team fight breaks out, you're not going to be able to be a part of that fight, so teleport is going to be the standard choice, however there are variables. The third spell is going to be Ignite, and Ignite is extremely powerful in your laning phase in certain matchups, so it's really good versus champions that have to all in you. So champions like Olaf, Darius, they have innate healing and also they have to fight you. If you're picking Darius and Olaf and not fighting your opponent, of course you're not really playing right, so Ignite's going to be very powerful in those types of matchups, even versus Jax as well. So champions that are forced to all in you, Ignite will give you a ton of value, and you can either decide between taking TP Ignite together, which is more safe, more standard, because if you get ganked, if you get chunked, you can TP back to lane, and of course in the side lane as well you've got TP, or you can take Ghost and Ignite. Now this is more risky, but I would recommend it in lower elo brackets as it does have the most 1v9 potential. You can get solo kills in your lane with Ignite, and you still have the insane scaling of Ghost for team fights and side laning later on, so this is the greediest option, Ghost and Ignite together. 
But if you don't like playing without TP, or you feel like, oh, the enemy jungler has a ton of gank set up, mine is playing Kane, I'm probably going to get pressured this game, then TP can be better as well, and you run TP and Ignite together. The fourth spell we have is Flash, but I don't recommend taking this over Ghost in many situations. However, the times where it is good to do so is when you're up against champions with key abilities that you have to Flash. So for example, if you versus a Malphite, Flash is going to be extremely valuable, because you can dodge their ulti with Flash, of course, so it's going to be very hard for them to gank you if you have your Flash up. And also if you're versus a comp that's going to be diving you 100%. So if they have, let's say, Samira AD carry, you know, Jarvan, Malphite top, champions like that that have to go forward, hard engage onto you, Yone mid, Flash can be more valuable because you can use it to dodge key spells like we talked about earlier, but also you don't need the ghost as much because you don't need that sticking power on the backline because they don't really have a backline. And the final spell you have access to is Exhaust, and it's extremely good versus champions with very telegraph burst. So the best two examples is versus Kennen. Kennen is the best champion to take Exhaust against because you know when he wants to be all in, he's going to be ulting and eing forward. And it's not only going to be good for the 1v1, it's also going to be extremely powerful in team fights, healing the Kennen off your team with Exhaust. And also it's good versus champions like Riven as well, where if she pops ulti, most likely she's going to be all in you and she's going to have Ignite Flash. So you can feel free to take TP Exhaust, or you can even take Ghost Exhaust if you wanted in that matchup. But I wouldn't take this very often. I would say those are the big two, but you don't even have to take it versus Riven. It's not compulsory, but I would say versus Kennen and you should be running this. So that's all the spells, but I am going to put the combination and spells on the side there in order of frequency. So basically in order of how likely it is for you to take these two spells together, because I don't want you guys to be taking the wrong combinations. I don't want you to take Ignite Exhaust together. You know, you don't really need two combat summoner spells. Ignite's going to be enough. So it's not worth sacrificing your Ghost for a double combat summon setup and also Ghost and Flash together. You're not really playing Olaf, Ghost is going to be enough sticking power to get onto your opponent. You know you do have a gap closer, so you don't need to have both. It's not going to be worth sacrificing your TP or even Ignite in some situations to have Flash, but I will put them in order, and you notice the first two are going to be the most common. You're going to be taking Ghost and TP or Ignite and TP most of the time, and the other spells are just when the perfect situation calls for it. Moving on to item builds, and as you can probably see in terms of your first two items, there's not a ton of variety, but we'll go through the options you have regardless. And as for your first item, your starting item, you are going to be going the Doran's Ring in most melee matchups. However, if you're versus a ranged champion, such as Teemo, such as Jace, of course Doran Shield is going to give a ton of value, or melee champions that have a ton of poke. So champions like GP, champions like Rumble especially, you definitely need the Doran Shield, but I would recommend going Doran's Ring in most matchups, because the extra damage you gain for your early Q poke with Doran's Ring is going to feel extremely significant, but of course you do need Doran Shield in hard matchups. Now as for your first buy, I don't want you guys to be going into a game tunneling on getting one of these items. Of course, tier 2 boots or a leeching lair feels extremely nice to get on your first recall. I don't want you to load into the game thinking, I'm going to play out my lane quite safe. I'm going to try farm out 1100, 1300 gold. That's not the best way to play Gwen. It is fine to base early on Gwen for Blasting Wand, refillable, or even an Amptome refillable if you make your opponent base early, if you're taking really good trades. So don't tunnel too hard on getting a significant first buy spike. I'm just saying if the lane is going quite boring, your lane opponent's not doing anything, then these are the item spikes that you want to be basing on. Now as for your mythic, I do recommend rushing Riftmaker in upwards of 90% of your games, maybe even 95, because Proto Belt, it can be a bit of a bait. I know there is a Gwen one trick that loves Proto Belt, and I have tried it myself multiple times, but you feel the significant loss in damage from not having Riftmaker, especially later on into the game, especially in an all-in, but you can go Proto Belt in games where you versus a ranged champion in lane, so let's say you're up against a Quinn, and their comp is extremely ranged as well. So let's say they have an Enchanter, Coglulu bot, Quinn top, range mid, then of course you can go Protobelt first, it'll feel quite nice, especially for the matchup against Quinn, however you should be defaulting to Riftmaker most of the time. And as for your second item, you will be going Nash's Tooth almost every single time. This item is going to feel amazing on Gwen. You're going to be farming like an absolute machine. You're going to be really strong in the side lane. The only time I'd build Shadow Flame instead of Nash's Tooth personally is if you're up against a Jackson lane. Because you have to fight this Jackson in the side lane. And of course, Nash's Tooth, the attack speed, not going to give you a ton of value in the 1v1. So I do recommend going Nash's Tooth most of the time. But Shadow Flame can feel quite good in the Jax matchup. And as for boots, it's going to be pretty straightforward. You can go plated steel caps if they have AD top or AD top jungle, Merc Treads if they have a ton of crowd control or a bit of a heavily magic damage comp, and you can go swiftness boots. These feel really good in matchups where they have significant slows. So champions like Nasus, champions like Olaf, even Singe, it can feel really good. And then cooldown boots feel quite nice if you don't need the other three.
If the other three aren't standing out to you, let's say you're versus a Camille top, she's not very strong, she's 0-1, you know the jungler's playing nidalee, then you don't really need to rush a defensive boot, you can go cooldown boots, or if you just base with that amount of gold, if you recall at a timer where you have 950, then you can just pick up the cooldown boots for an early spike. And to clear up a couple questions I might see coming, there is no situation that I could see where you'd ever build Sorcerer Boots on Gwen. Most of the time, you will be building a defensive boot, but if you don't need it, if you feel like you don't need Steel Caps or Merc Treads, I recommend going cooldown boots because having your Ghost and not having it is there's just a huge difference. You're definitely going to feel it in the game, trying to play out a team fight when your Ghost is on cooldown compared to having it. It's just a 9 day difference between how strong you feel, so having your Ghost on more often is going to feel a lot more valuable than the slight extra damage you gain from the Sork Boots. And as for the Nash's Tooth, I know there are a couple one tricks who rush this as a first item, but I strongly advise against it. The build path for this item is extremely ugly, it's going to feel really bad in trades. Coming back to lane with an Amp Tome or a Recurve Bow, it's going to be a lot weaker than the Rift Maker build path, where you can either go Leeching Lair if you're in an all-in matchup or if you want sustain, or you can just go pure AP with Blasting Wand and Amp Tome. It's going to feel a lot better than the straight build path of Nash's Tooth. Of course, you're going to be squishier as well, not having any HP, even though completing it as an item may feel quite good early on. The build path is so weak, it's better to go Rift Maker and have a stronger laning phase overall. Moving on to your third item, and Rabadon's is going to be the biggest spike by far. If you can get Rift Maker Nashes into Rabs around level 16, you're going to be basically unstoppable, your damage is going to be insane. Gwen has really high AP scalings, however it's unrealistic to get Rabadon's third every single game. Some games you will need the Void Stuff, if they have a ton of magic resist, Void Stuff is going to be more valuable of course. And the thing about Death Cap is the build path is extremely expensive, so there might be some situations where you're basing before a Baron fight, you have around 1100, then of course you can get the Blinded Jewel, build into Void Stuff instead, and you're going to be fine. Or even if you base around 800, grabbing an early stopwatch, building into a Zonyas is going to be good, but there are certain games where you could sit on stopwatch and then go rabs for sure, and there are games where you need to rush Zonyas completely. So the games where you need to rush Zonyas as a third item is going to be when they have very strong Assassin Champs. So when they have a Fed Z, Talon Mid, Kiana, champs like that, they can just dive onto you and just completely one-shot you, then of course you are going to need the Zonyas to block most of their burst, and then you can also go Cosmic Drive. Now the situation where you'd go Cosmic Drive over Rabs is in terms of backing with certain amounts of gold. So if you back with 1250 and you don't need the Void Staff or the Zonyas, for example, of course you go needlessly large and you build into Rabs, but if you base with around 900, you know fights are breaking now, Baron spawning soon, then you can just grab the early Fiendish Codex, bit of an extra power boost, and then build into your Cosmic Drive. It's a lot cheaper than Death Cap. So also if you base with enough gold to get the whole item, which is going to be very rare, but if you can do so, then that's good as well. Or if you're just versus a bunch of ranged champions in general, then Cosmic Drive can feel a lot more valuable sometimes over Death Cap. It really just depends. But I'd say the biggest variable is going to be the build path is a lot cheaper and the items cheaper so if you need to spike in a hurry then of course cosmic drive is going to be a lot better and then if you need magic resist now i recommend abyssal mask over banshee's veil because it's a lot cheaper the build path is 10 times better it's just a lot cheaper and the item is just really strong as well especially if you have an extra ap champion on your team i recommend going abyssal mask if you need the magic resist so i'd only go it if you absolutely need it if the ap carries a fed but for the most part you wouldn't build mr at all on this champion you'd just stay on mercury treads if you needed it and then you also have the option for morellos I would stay away from this most of the time, it's better if someone else on your team builds healing cup because Rabadon's power is just a lot higher than this item of course, but there are some situations where you need it if they have insane healing. So champions like Sir, let's say they have Fiora top, Soraka support, then of course Morales can feel quite good, you know maybe a Dr. Mundo, champs like that, if they have absurd amounts of healing and no one else on your team is building healing cup then of course you might have to bite the bullet and do so. And as for your last two items, it's the same reasoning for each of them, however I do recommend for each 6 item build on Gwen, you do have a death cap and void stuff. No matter what items you've built throughout the game, your 6 items should finish off by having a void and death cap, because it's going to be the highest damage by far from that point into the game, and I have an example down below that you can use for inspiration, and for the most part that's what your build is going to be looking like. I'm next in recovering the laning phase, and laning on Gwen has a pretty high skill ceiling, so I will be covering a bunch of examples, a ton of variables, and as for our first one, we are up against a Trundle. Now, Lethal Tempo Trundle, of course, has a lot stronger all-in than me, especially early on, but I'm a lot stronger than him in short trades. So I want to look, be looking to abuse the short trades, not take an extended all-in until he's low HP, and it's really important that I secure push. You should be looking to get push in the majority of your games as Gwen. Of course, you can't do that in every matchup. Of course, if you try to push against a Darius, he's just going to kill you. But for the most part, you if you can get push, you should, because you have a huge AoE spell in terms of your Q. So if you can get push, it's going to be really beneficial, because you're going to be leveling up before them. 
But here you can see I'm level 2 versus level 1, where even though he could beat me in an extended all-in if everything was even, it's not, right? I'm level 2, I have more creeps than him, so it's very hard for him to go anywhere near the wave, and unfortunately in this game I did push my wave too quickly. You want to be pushing a bit slower than I did, so that you have room. You have room to poke them outside of their tower if they walk up to go for a last hit. So as you can see, when he goes for a CS and my Q is up, that's the time where I'm trying to Q, which is really important. You don't really want to be trying to max range snipe people with Q, especially level one. It's best to go for it when they go for a last hit. But here I'm just looking to cleanly crash my wave. Because I'm just adapting, I push wave two way too quickly. He's under the tower, hard for me to poke him down. So now I'm going to be looking to proxy. So I go two points in Q, which you should be doing in the majority of your matchups, by the way. Two points in Q on Gwen makes your trading a lot stronger. And of course, it gives you this side benefit of being able to proxy. But I'd only really skill W level three in situations where they have a key range spell that you want to be blocking. So let's say they have a Vladimir, for example, he's going two points in Q if you're pushing, most likely, if he's good, and you can use your W to block his empowered Q, then of course it's going to be fine. But for the most part, two points in Q, especially versus melee champions, it's going to be a lot better for your trading. So I'll skip the walk back to lane, and as you can see, I'm building towards Ninja Tabby because they have AD top jungle. Played in Steel Cap's going to feel quite nice, and especially against Trundle. It's really important for me to space this guy, to kite him, because if I just sit there and fight him to the death, it's in his favor 100%. So here I come back, and because I proxied, I have time to freeze the wave outside my tower, which is really important on Gwen looking to freeze, especially level 6. Freezing is going to be allow you to net yourself a ton of solo kills. However, here I look to freeze at level 4, which is not the best timer. I just do so that it, so he stays. So even though I do take a slightly bad trade, you notice I held onto my TP because I proxied. So now I'm in a situation where he has to TP back to lane, or I'm going to hard push the wave. He's going to miss stuff, and even here I'm stopping his recall again, putting pressure onto him. I'm making it so he's forced to use TP which is really important because it sets me up to be able to chunk him and then base and TP back myself. And then I'm going to be in a situation where he can't really fight me, which is important because he that's all he can do, right? He's playing Trundle, a melee range champion, no range spell. He has to be able to all in me or his champ's not going to be very useful. So I'll speed it up now. Now I'm just slow pushing under his tower and my intention is to crash away so that it will bounce back to me. So here, that's just what I'm trying to do, trying to poke him while I'm higher level than him, trying to abuse the fact that level 5 is 4, I have more minions, and then I'm going to be looking to crash the wave and bounce it back towards me. It's pretty hard to tower dive somebody under tower as Gwen, to be honest, as it is possible, but for the most part, the main way you're going to be solo killing on this champion is by allowing the wave to come back towards you around the time you hit level 6. But as you see here, I've TP'd back, it's around 5 minutes, and you see I'm halfway to a level 6, so by the time the wave is outside my tower, that's when I'm going to be getting my ultimate, it's the perfect position for me to look to punish him, which is another reason why you really want to be able to get pushed in your matchup, because if the waves ping pong back and forth like they have been in this game, then you're going to be able to abuse the all-in window on level 6. So here I trade ghosts with him, because I don't want to be in a situation where I pop ghost and flash, uh, sorry, ghost and ulti later on, and he just goes away. So now I'm just trading ghosts so that by the time I have ulti, there's nothing he can do. I've burnt his TP from my earlier laning, and now his game is completely over. The wave is coming back towards me. I hard win. I'm full HP, basically, versus low HP, and I'm going to be... I have stronger items than him. Basically, everything is in my favor. There's nothing he can do, but unfortunately, this poppy... Well, fortunately, I guess, this poppy comes and punishes this trundle being screwed, this, po this trundle not having any options, and we kill him. However, the way I played out my early lane, it's very standard for Gwen. So you want to be trying to secure push in a matchup where you can. You're going to be crashing big waves under the tower. And then you can proxy if it looks good. But just letting the wave come back into you. Poking them as it comes in. Trimming the wave. And then eventually you're going to get to a point. After a couple ping pongs. After a bunch of wave trimming. A bunch of chunking them down to low HP. You're going to get to the point where you can all in them with your ghost and ulti. With the wave frozen outside your tower. And that is the prime time where you get solo kills on Gwen. I'm going to show more example of this, of allowing the wave to come back towards you, and in this matchup I'm up against Aatrox. So a lot more standard than up against Trundle, and you'll notice I took Ignite and Ghost. Now, Ignite and Ghost of course is the best in terms of combat power for this matchup. Ignite to cut his healing, and Ghost to chase him down and dodge his spells. But the reason I took both together, instead of TP, where TP is better most of the time, is because this game they have a Xerath mid and a Renata cog bot. So I 100% need Ghost, but I took Ignite as well, because there's no really way, no real way we can teamfight in this game. They have insane scaling, insane teamfight, so many range champs. So in this game, I want to be winning primarily through side laning and getting a big advantage in my lane to do so, which is why I took double combat sums. And here I'm just looking to three wave crash and chunk them as I go. It's fine to trade even, especially if you're going to be looking to base early, which is what I'm going to be doing. And it's important to note, if you don't take TP on Gwen, you really want to be securing yourself the first recall. Because if I were to have stayed right now and let the wave come back into me, even though I am technically higher HP than him, 
he can play it out. If his jungler comes, for example, ganks me, chunks me, or if his jungler just comes and pushes out the wave, he can play. So he bases and TPs back to lane after his jungler helps him crash that wave, and then he's going to have item advantage, full HP, and I'm going to be completely stuck. So here I chose to cheat a recall and come back to lane, and I went tier 1 boots because I want to be... I wanted to get a refillable, because I'm going to be looking to heavy trade on this situation, and you'll notice I'm pinging for my jungler to come, because the wave is coming back towards me. I'd Normally, if my jungler didn't come on this timer, I'd be trimming it and looking to ghost and ignite chase this guy down the lane. So it's basically a guaranteed advantage. Either I'm going to get a kill from this guy, or we're going to be able to 2v2 it. If their jungler came faster and we win the 2v2, of course I got an item advantage. I'm higher HP, I'm a lot stronger with double combat sums. So you can really not just set up yourself for success by doing this but set up your jungler as well and looking back i actually should have pinged this gank a lot a lot more ahead of time sorry after i crashed my wave and i was basing walking back to lane i should have been assist pinging in the lane about where i'm standing now letting my jungler know the wave is going to be here in about a minute in about 70 seconds it's going to be a prime time to gank and then it would set him up for success a lot more than me just pinging that opportunity on the fly so that's something you can look to do as well ping the ganks in advance and then you can have your jungler time his gank for as the wave's coming back towards you and you're looking to an all in them as well but even if your jungler doesn't come you're guaranteed either a situation where you can all in your opponent or a situation where their jungler feels pressured to walk back top and put clear the wave under your tower now for this example i wanted to showcase what to do when you're up against a champion that is much stronger than you level one and in this game of course i'm up against darius one of the strongest top laners in the game and you'll notice i took over the river bush which is really important the second the base gates drop you want to be running there as fast as possible because you want to know where the darius is where he's setting up his camp so because i took over the bush i saw him walk in and then i also saw him leave it so now i know he's going to be taking over a lane bush which is very important because you want to be walking in with your minion wave and then warding the bush level one so that if he goes on you, of course, all the minions are going to chase him. And now what he's doing what he should be doing. He's waiting for the minions to settle before he looks to punish me. And keep in mind, this is an Ignite Darius, a lot stronger than, you know, probably the strongest champion you could verse. And here you'll see I skilled my E. Where normally you do skill Q in most matchups because you want to use it to secure push and also take the best possible trades you can. But up against really strong powerhouse laners such as Darius, Ignite Riven, it's like Olaf as well. E start is going to be better because you want to be allowing the wave to come back into you. And you'll notice I let him hit me first. I let him auto attack me before I eat away because I want all these casters to turn on him. So here they did turn on, they did just that. And that brief moment when they're all hitting him and not hitting his minions is making the wave come back towards me. So now I'm taking over the bush that I have a warden as well. The casters are still ganging up on him. And here he makes a mistake. Here he should be walking back to his wave because my second wave is coming in. Of course he doesn't want to tank it, but you'll see this whole time I'm not fighting him. I'm spacing him back and forwards, and now he makes his mistake. He should walk back right now, come in with my wave basically, but now I see my wave is next to him, so I look to all in him here. Not all in him, I pop e and start fighting him, and it's not the biggest trade in the world, but it's an opportunity where all my minions were hitting him, so I could trade back, but I still don't want to be all in him. Here's an Ignite Darius. If he gets five stacks, of course I'm going to lose, so my main purpose is to let the wave come back towards me exactly what i'm doing and i'm pretty sure in this game the end result wasn't that great i force a one for one which normally would have been good but uh if he was ghost flash darius sorry i normally would have won it but he had ignite i should have adapted better but you can see the way i want you to be playing level one versus these strong powerhouse champions darius ignite riven olaf is very very safe you take over each bush one by one the two main bushes that they use to get behind you and then you look to walk in with your minion wave you make it so you start e so you can space them you can get away from them if they try to chase you down and then you look to trade onto them on timers when your wave is coming in but for the most part you're just going to be farming these minions that i'm farming now you're just going to be trying to get as much cs as you can when it comes under tower and then your time will come where you can trade onto them later so here I shouldn't have traded on this timer, it was slightly too far out of tower, but it was able to be, it was actually able to be a one for one, which is fine because I have TP and I didn't really play around the fact that he had ignite to be honest. But for the most part, the main thing I want you to focus on is a level one, because if you can play level one like this versus really hard matchups, you're going to be able to neutralize and scale up into the game quite nicely. Now that's it for the landing concepts, but in terms of the little trading patterns you need to know about, on Gwen the biggest thing is punishing your opponent for going for CS. So you don't want to just be sniping with your Q like we talked about before, you want to time it so as they go for a last hit you're utilizing your Q or your QE to punish them for getting that creep. And another tip that's going to help you in a ton of matchups is you can actually buffer your Q through crowd control. So let's say a Jax jumps into your head with stun, you can actually buffer your Q so that you're getting the damage down while you're stunned, you're still snipping him down, and that is really important in a lot of matchups. So versus Jax specifically, versus Camille, if she's eating onto you, you can buffer your Q, versus Yone, so many champions with crowd control, you really need to learn and figure out the timing of how to buffer your Q through them. 
And the final takeaway for laning is I don't want you guys to think just because Gwen has a really strong all in at 6 that you're just fighting your opponent full HP versus full HP because Gwen is extremely good at short trades as well so you should be looking to utilize that. So ideally on Gwen you're going to be looking to take 100 to 0 trades so QE them and walk away, wait for your next QE cooldown, don't take that all in and just chip away at their HP lower and lower before you look for the all in. Now, some matchups, you can just run them down for full HP, of course, but the ideal, especially in the skill matchups or the matchups that are not quite in Gwen's favor, is you want to be chipping them down with your Q before you look for these all-ins. And a side benefit that you'll find if you play this playstyle is that it's going to be very hard for the enemy jungler to gank you. Where let's say you're just fighting this Camille, you're both half HP, even though you technically win the all-in, it's very easy for the enemy jungler to gank you. However, if you're staying high HP, chipping away at his, it's very hard for the enemy jungler to gank you without you being able to kill his lane opponent or able to turn it as a 1v2. Another tip I'm going to give you for laning on Gwen is don't be afraid to use your ultimate for a really good trade. You don't always have to commit your ultimate for a kill, you can use it to chunk your opponent to low HP and then they're going to be too scared to walk up to the wave. Up next we have abilities, tips and tricks and we'll start with Gwen's Q which is her main damage ability and the most important thing you need to know about this ability is you want to be hitting them with the center part where it is a cone of damage but if you can hit them with the center part of it not only is it going to convert half your damage to true damage but it's also going to apply your passive which is going to give you percentage max HP damage it's going to heal you on some of the damage out so it's really important that you have a high focus on hitting the center part of your Q. Now even though the Q looks like it's a cone of damage in front of you or whichever direction you're facing, it's still able to hit whatever champion or minion is inside of your character or even slightly behind you, their range is quite big, so keep that in mind if somebody's literally on top of you, your Q is still going to hit them. And the hitbox is a little bit bigger than it looks, so if you're using normal cast for whatever reason or you use the indicator, keep in mind that any minion or champion that is slightly outside of the indicator range, they're still going to get hit by the Q. Where not only is the Q great for wave clear, it's also extremely powerful for last hitting. Where any minion that is 20% HP or below, they are going to get executed from any point of damage from your Q. So there will be a lot of thresholds you run into on Gwen, where your Q doesn't quite one shot the caster minions, it leaves them all 1 HP, or quite low HP. So it's actually better to auto attack all the caster minions once before using your Q instead of the reverse. Also keep in mind the way Gwen's Q works is that each snip does extra damage of course, but the final snip does significantly more damage, where let's say at rank 1 each snip does 10 damage, but the final snip actually does 60. So it's way more important to hit the final end of your snip, and you don't always need to tunnel vision on getting 4 stacks every time, as long as you can hit the final snip the damage is going to be quite significant. Now the most important thing you need to know about Gwen's Q is you can actually cast your E during the Q animation to move your character, you know, wherever you dash to and redirect the Q damage. So this is the most important combo you need to know on Gwen if you want to call it a combo, So you, and I wouldn't recommend playing Gwen without it. And something interesting about Gwen's Q is even if you have 4 stacks of it or 0 stacks, the time it takes to finish the Q animation is the exact same. Also, very similar to the fact that you can Q plus E, you can also Q plus flash. So let's say, for example, you are queuing your opponent and your E's on cooldown and they flash away. You can actually follow their flash with your flash and your Q animation will still go off and you'll get the damage done. And the next step is you can actually chain all three of those spells together. So you can Q plus E plus flash to close a lot of distance. Now, even though in laning phase you primarily want to be using your Q when you have as many stacks as possible, keep in mind for the mid to late game, sometimes that can be unrealistic. Where if you're approaching a team fight from a flank position and you have no stacks, don't just E forward try to get full stacks before you Q. Keep in mind you can utilize your Q straight away. Try to get the final snip, of course try to get the center part as well. The final snip does the most damage and then you can start stabbing them. And by the time your second Q is off cooldown, you're probably going to have four stacks ready for it. And the final tip for Gwen's Q is keep in mind after you utilize Q plus E, try to prime your auto attack ahead of time before the Q animation is finished. Because you can Q plus E plus auto very smoothly as long as you've clicked them before the Q animation is done. Moving on to Gwen's W. Now this is one of her key abilities, it essentially creates a zone around you which makes you untargetable and even if an opponent shoots a skill shot at you and they're outside the zone it's unable to hit you. So it's really important, let's say you're about to get hit by a Xerath stun, something like that, you put up your W, it's not going to hit you, it's going to go right past you. Someone shoots you and AD carry auto attacks you and you put up your zone and they're outside the zone, that's not going to hit you as well. And which means they have to go into melee range of you to do anything to you, and also you gain bonus armor and magic resist as well in the shield, so in the zone zone. So even if you're fighting a Fiora where you can't really block any spells, you still want to pop it up for the resists. Now some tips with Gwen's W is the first tip is it's going to drop minion aggro. So if you take a heavy trade against your opponent where they have a big minion wave and you're walking away trying to finish off the trade, you can put up the W to stop all the caster minions from hitting you, or any minion outside of the zone in general. 
The next tip is even though it says specifically in the tooltip that monsters cannot target you, I mean can target you, sorry, which is true, even if you're in your zone and you're outside of the Baron pit, he can still target you and shoot at you, it's actually going to block the damage. So when you're doing Baron, which is important because Gwen is extremely fast at doing Baron, you want to be standing in the corner like I'm showing on the screen now, putting up your W and it's going to completely block the Baron damage. But keep in mind if a team fight is breaking out, it's not worth wasting your W for this. Just do it if you're rushing Baron and there's no enemy team contesting. Now with Gwen's W you also have the option to recast W to move it to your current location. However keep in mind you can only do so once and also even if you don't push W if you walk out of your W's range it's going to move with you. So keep that in mind it's going to follow you if you exit the range so if you don't want it to be in a certain position be careful with leaving it and you can only move it once so be very careful. And something to keep in mind if you're quite new to Gwen is even though your W makes it so you're untargetable, it doesn't quite do that for your teammates. So if you block a hook or a Caitlyn ult, anything like that, and you put your W up, it's still going to hit your teammate right behind you. So keep that in mind, be careful with that. But for the most part, not really a problem, I would say, unless you're blocking something crucial for your AD carry. Something else to keep in mind is when you cast your W, every enemy champion outside of the circle is going to have a broken sword symbol on them. And that symbol basically means these champions cannot currently deal damage to you, unless of course they've already got a damage over time on you. Let's say they ignited you or Malza E and then walked out of the circle. You're still going to take that damage, of course. Basically just means that if you see that symbol on them, they can not currently do damage to you. And that once they walk into the circle, that sword will disappear and you'll know when they're in there. So it's good to know for when someone is standing right on the border, right on the edge of your W, to see if they're in there or not. Moving on to Gwen's E. Now, Gwen's E is a gap closer, but you can also use it as an auto attack reset, where if you auto attack E auto attack, it's going to feel extremely smooth and cancel the auto attack animation. And for 4 seconds after casting Gwen's E, you're going to have bonus attack range, bonus magic damage on hit, and also bonus attack speed. However, during that 4 seconds, if you do not get a single auto attack down, the cooldown is going to be max duration, but if you get can get even a single auto attack down during those 4 seconds, it's going to refund a portion of the cooldown. And the final tip for Gwen's E is you can actually use this to jump over walls, and you can jump over some pretty big ones, especially around raptors in red, not just these tiny walls around the river bush. Moving on to Gwen's R, and you can actually cast your E during the R animation, it's actually going to extend the distance, so if you R then E, instead of the reverse, you're still going to get the bonus range from your E dash. And again, you can do the same thing with flash, you can R then flash, and it's still going to give you that bonus range. And just like you have the ability to Q plus E plus flash, you can also do the same thing with your ultimate, where if you R, E, flash together in a smooth combo, you're going to get the maximum range possible for your ulti snipe. And it's pretty rare that you're going to do this, to be honest, but if somebody is running away, and let's say they're a 1k shutdown, you want to snipe them, then of course you can utilize this. Now, Gwen's ultimate does have three charges, but you are put on a bit of a timer after you use the first one. If you don't shoot your second stack before the timer runs out, it's going to place the ability on a full cooldown. However, if you use the second charge just as the timer is about to run out, the third charge's timer is going to get completely reset. And the final tip I'm going to give with his ultimate, and in my opinion this is the most important, is holding your R. A lot of people feel very tempted when they use their R to just shoot all three stacks as much as possible as soon as they're, you know, they're in the fight. They're just shooting their ulti as soon as they can, but sometimes it can be better to hold it, especially if your opponent is running away from you. Holding it and waiting to see what they do can be more beneficial because they're mostly, most likely going to be trying to juke your ultimate. If they're good, they're going to be trying to dodge back and forwards, where if you just hold your ultimate, beat them down with auto attacks and E's and Q's, and eventually they're going to be in a position where you can guarantee hit your ulti. I'm next in recovering matchups, and this tier list was quite difficult to make because I'm trying to make it for all ELO brackets. I'm trying to make it apply in some way for every player, but there are going to be some variables. So to give an example, if you are uncomfortable on Gwen, and you go up against an Ignite Pantheon, and he's a Panth main, you're going to get completely destroyed most likely, because that matchup can be very difficult early on, but if you can neutralize till you're around level 7, level 9, you've got plated seal caps, you're going to be fine. It's just very hard to get to that point if you're uncomfortable in the matchup, and a lot of these matchups are very similar. Jax especially, this matchup I would normally have as a skill matchup to be honest, but I did bump him up a bit, because I know unless you have high mastery on Gwen, you're probably going to get rolled as the ease of execution favors Jax, and there are a ton of variables like that, but for the most part, this list should be pretty accurate. Now as for the hard matchups, in my opinion Ignite Rumble is the hardest matchup by far, it's quite difficult to deal with, but it's not unwinnable. You mainly want to be playing to stay high HP, take short trades, and punish his mistakes, where if he overheats in front of you, or if he's really low heat, if he has bad heat management, then you can look to all in him with your ulti, and even if you don't kill him on your ulti timer, he's still going to be chunked, and he's a no TP champ, right? He's Ignite Rumble, so he's very vulnerable to be ganked as well, so if he's pushing, trying to get you under tower, and you're respecting the poke, you're not trading with him and letting him cook you down, if you're high enough HP, you can receive a jungle gank, especially if you use your ultimate to chunk beforehand. 
And as for Kennen, like we talked about in this spell section, I recommend taking Exhaust in this matchup. Even though for lane, Ignite might be technically better for a solo kill, Exhaust is going to neutralize what Kennen wants to do in the game. And also for lane as well, it's not bad, especially for setting up ganks. And you mainly want to be playing to get 1100 gold. You want to be trying to get Merc Treads. And even if he plays really well and makes you base earlier, you still want to be building towards it. You can go no no Magic or no Magic Boots. And you want to be rushing these Merc Treads because once you have them, you're going to have options in this matchup. Now, as for Riven, this matchup can be quite difficult if the Riven has a very high level of mastery, but if she doesn't, it's going to be fine. For the most part, the biggest tip I can give you is utilize your E, your QE backwards, where if you QE towards her, very easy for her to pop ulti, pop ignite, and beat you down, but if she tries to go towards you with EQ, EQW, you need to time it so you're QEing backwards before you get stunned by the W and buffering the Q through the crowd control. Now as for Fiora, this matchup is kind of similar where you have to predict when she's going to be queuing onto you and pri uh, prime your queue ahead of time so that the center part of the queue is hitting her. But it's very hard, it's a very skillful matchup and I would say the only reason I put it in the hard tier instead of the slightly you know opponent favorite tier is just because if you versus a Fiora that takes Conqueror, even Conqueror Ignite, it can be very difficult, very easy for her to kill you. So for you, I would say recommend taking Ignite in this matchup and trying to predict her queues with your queue. Moving on to the opponent side of matchups, now I strongly recommend when you're versing any ranged champion in this list to rush your tier 2 boots as fast as possible. Even if you base at a timer, where you don't have 1100, you still want to be building towards it, get tier 1s, get no magic, whatever you need to get these tier 2s as fast as possible, and also run ghost. Spacing is going to be extremely important in these matchups, so you want to make sure you're equipped. You have your tier 2s, you have your ghost, and then you can look to really dodge their skill shots, get really good trades down, and make it so it's very hard for them to space you. Now, as for some melee matchups, I'll go through them, where if you're playing up against a Jax, keep in mind, he actually gets pushed in this matchup. So I recommend going TP and Ignite in this one. Ghost is not that useful against Jax. And play to poke him down, of course. You want to be taking short trades against him, chip him down with your Q. And level 1, make sure you utilize your bone plating very well. Where if you just let him auto-attack you first, without utilizing his E, he can just wait out your bone plating, and then it's going to be a very good trade for him. But if you make him fully commit his E, before he pops your bone plating, you can buffer your Q through his CC and get a really good trade down onto him. Let the wave come back towards you, try to bait him to crash wave 2 if you can, and then once you have the wave near your tower or outside your tower, very easy for you in that situation. Now as for another champion, let's say Yone, this one is actually quite difficult, I was pretty close to putting him in the hard tier, the only reason why I didn't is because Yone is quite a hard champion, not many people can pilot him very well, and in this matchup I'd say have a huge focus on dodging his Qs, you're going to be trying to make it, so you're walking towards him, walking towards the minion, you know he's going to Q you, and then you can either dodge it or sidestep it, and then you can QE onto him, beat him down. Of course not, If he, even if he missed you with his Q and he got Q3, he's going to be in a good position to chase you down. Just keep in mind, play around his Q3, of course, but if his Q is fresh on cooldown the second he uses it, you have a brief timer to trade onto him. But I will say it's still in his favor, so don't get overconfident. There's just a lot of situations where you can trade onto him quite well, and he can't do the same back onto you. And then even at level 6, you actually have a ton of kill threat against him. Keep that in mind. It's just, in general, if he's playing exceptionally well, this matchup's going to be quite difficult. Moving on to the skill matchup tier. Now, a bunch of champions in this list you want to be taking primarily short trades against. So to give an example, up against Olaf, you want to be taking short trades with your Q, not really using your E if you don't have to, queuing him when he goes for a last hit, and then if he tries to chase you down, try to dodge his Q with your E. Once you have Swift and Spooch, you don't really have to, of course, you could walk it out, maybe even block with a W, but you mainly want to be taking short trades. You don't want to be fighting Olaf full HP versus full, because he's going to win most of the time. You want to be chipping him down with your Q when he goes for last hits, and then when he's 60%, 40% HP, whatever you want to, whatever depends on the game state, then you can look to all in him. You never want to be fighting him full versus full, unless you've outscaled him at that point. You want to be chipping him down with your Q, and another example example is Irelia, where the same, she's going to beat you if it's full versus full, but it's really easy for you to take short trades against her, because you can always dodge her E with your E, or block her with your W, so it's very hard for her to get any meaningful damage down onto you, unless she can hit that E, but it's a skill matchup, right? You need to dodge her E, she's going to be trying to use her E quickly by dashing to a creep and hiding it, so it's really skill intensive, but I would say it's slightly in Gwen's favor, the only reason I put it in the skill matchup tier is because it's easier for Irelia to play this one. Now, as for the Gwen favored matchups, the biggest mistake I see people make in these ones is they overreach for the kill. Where, of course, you have a lot of threat onto champions like Orn, champions like Camille. However, Gwen is actually quite easily gankable. Unless you're high HP, if you're, let's say, 60 versus 60 versus Camille, it's very easy for her to set up a gank setup against you. So if you're trying to stay high HP, chip them, get them lower and lower, don't hyper-focus on a solo kill. Focus on getting them as low as possible, and then depending on the matchup, so versus Camille, you want to make the wave come back towards you, threaten a freeze, try to kill it with your ulti there. But if you're versus Aorn, for example, you primarily want to be playing to demolish his tower. 
So you're taking demolish, building a big wave, crashing into his tower, and looking to break tower plates, looking to proxy. You don't really want to be hyper focusing on solo killing these tanks. You want to be playing to blow up the tower. But if you versus a champion that needs resources like Camille, like or Garen, for example, you want to be making them leave their tower and keeping your wave in a good state right outside yours, trying to stay high HP, chip them lower and lower, and make it very hard for their jungler to save them. And the free matchup, like we just touched upon, you want to be blowing up their tower. Your goal when you verse any of these champions is you want to be blowing up their tower before 14 minutes. The faster you can get their tower down, the better, because then you can start to impact the mid game. But for the most part, you don't want to hyper focus on solo killing a Cho'Gath for a Malphite. Of course, pre six, that's going to be extremely beneficial because the tower is going to be very tanky pre five minutes. So of course, if you want to play to kill them pre five minutes is your best bet. Or even if you want to fight around 530, you know, you get level six around 515, 520. Of course, you can play for a kill. I'm not saying never play to kill them. I'm just saying if it's around eight minutes, nine minutes, and you're freezing outside your tower, trying to kill the zero one Cho'Gath, it's probably more beneficial for you to blow up his tower instead, try to proxy eat enemy camps and impact the map that way. Up next we're going to be covering the mid game and the most important concept you need to learn when playing the mid game on Gwen is you need to be playing as selfish as possible. Gwen is a full damage champ, she's one of the, the most selfish champs in the game for top lane. You provide no CC, you don't provide any frontline, all you provide for the game is damage and extremely good scaling, so you want to be playing to get yourself ahead. So in this game, the next objective supporting is Dragon. You see Dragon is up right now, so here I'm looking to go top. If Dragon was dead, I'd go bot, because you want to be playing on the opposite side of the next objective. Where now, I could actually look to go bot, because the enemy team is starting this Dragon, but my Kaylin's rotated there, I feel like it'd be a bit awkward to kick her out. She's 0-5, and the reason I want to showcase this example is because I'm the only one that's ahead in this game. You can see my bot lane, 0-5 on Kaylin. That's the top lane classic, where if you're winning your lane, your bot lane has to feed. There goes without saying. My jungler, 0-3, not doing the best, and my mid laner is going even. He's doing okay. But for the most part, I'm the only one ahead in this game, so I felt like it'd be a great example of how to carry in this position. So here I'm looking to go top, and you see I'm even eating Scuttle on the way, because you want to be growing as big and strong as possible, right? And the reason I'm not eating Gromp and Wolves as well, is because I don't want to give Rumble a timer to roam. Rumble would have pushed this wave in, like he did, and looked to roam mid and kill my teammates. If I were to eat those extra camps, I only really had time to do crab. And after you have done your job, your job is to create pressure, then you can look to farm as much as possible. So here I've kind of crashed a wave, I've crashed a wave under tower. You can see the next wave's coming in, so Rumble has to either answer that, or he needs to group up and lose that CS. So here you see Sorry answered, and I was fogging in between. I'm hiding in between mid and top, and I'm going to commit mid if something good happens. If Rumble didn't answer, I actually overcommitted. I shouldn't have jumped this wall prematurely. But if Rumble didn't answer top, if he went mid, I would have looked to blow up this top tower. But because he did answer, I'm looking to fog down. And if a fight is breaking out mid, that is when I commit. If this mid fight didn't look good for me, which it does, right? I want to kill this double buff Wukong. Unfortunately, I didn't get the kill. If this mid fight didn't look like a very high chance of a fight breaking out, I would have gone back top, tried to eat camps, tried to break the top tier two, played primarily for myself. But there was an opportunity where they were overdiving mid on my timer, so I was able to commit. And now the dragon's dead. The next objective spawning is Herald. So I'll skip forward a little bit. The next objective is going to be Herald, so I head straight bot. And as you can see, I'm heading straight for the Krugs. I want to farm as much as possible, and Azir's already here. So Azir's not able to roam mid. I literally see him on my screen, so it's fine for me to go for the Krugs. And I clear that wave there just because I don't want him to push a wave under my tower. But as you can see, I'm playing primarily to get myself as strong as possible. And it's hard for me to beat Azir on this timer. I'm probably going to do so anyway. As, as you can see, he has a tower, so I can't really look to pressure him too hard. But now my Rao here, so I'm able to block the Azir ulti with my W, w worked out quite nicely, and now I'm able to push, so good run by Rao, definitely. But as you can see, I'm playing primarily for myself. I'm looking to need all the camps I can, push all the waves in, and here on a lot of champs you would look to base, because I'm low mana, I can't really pressure the map, but on Gwen you need to break that mindset, you need to do what's best for you, and here getting that extra wave, getting this extra tower, even though it means my tempo is going to be horrible, which means my team might get punched in the future, it's really good for me, so that is the mindset you need to have for Gwen, you need to get as strong as possible on this champ, and now I'm going to look to base after this, no mana, of course very awkward to clear the wave, and come out onto the map with my two item spike. Now, coming back onto the map, my game plan is going to be the same. I want to be pushing my wave under tower, making someone respond to me, and devouring every jungle camp I can see on the map. But here, as he overextends, we look to go on him. Of course, he dashes a wall, and that is my mindset play primarily to create pressure, make somebody respond to me, and then eat everything I possibly can. And if somebody doesn't respond to me, that's when I look to break tower, or even in a game where I can ignore them and break the tower, that's when you want to do so as well. 
So if you reverse a Scion or an Ornn, for example, there'll be some situations where you can ignore them after crashing a Cannon Wave and break the tier 2, but for the most part, you're just happy with making them respond to you and then using that time, whilst they're farming the wave under tower, to farm as much camps as possible. And if a fight breaks out mid and you're there to create a 5v4, of course it's fine, but for the most part, as you see here, the enemy is playing aggressive mid, they're looking for a fight, but that is not my problem. I want to play for what's best for me. And here, breaking this tier 2 will give me an insane amount of gold, especially on this patch where they buff the extra gold. You see, I just got around 700 and same and now i'm gonna send this guy away <laughs> unlucky on his flash and now i just want to base as soon as possible i'm not in a position where i can pressure there's no item spike i can greed for and i want to be one step ahead the enemy team right now they're kind of wasting time trading kills with my team they're just fighting them trading one for one two for two Actually, it looks like they're winning 2 for 0, but I just want to play what's best for me. I don't want to get sucked into these fights, which is a big mistake a lot of players make on Gwen. You get sucked into unfavorable fights, you drop your position on the side, and as you can see, because I didn't allow myself to rotate mid, I was able to gain a massive advantage in terms of the tier 2, and Rumble should have lived to be fair, but I got that extra kill, and also an extra crunk uh, camp. So I'm just farming as much as possible, making myself as strong as possible, and I'm only getting sucked into a fight if it's on my terms. If I'm creating a 5v4, a favorable fight for my team, that's when I want to be looking to fight. And if not, if it looks like one of those sloppy, you know, 1 for 1, 2 for 2s, then I want to be playing primarily to get myself a hit. So I wasted my ult here, that was a mistake on my part, but now I'm just looking to get strong. See, so eat these, uh, eat this Gromp, get as strong as possible, hope this guy doesn't take it, nice. And now I look, want to look to keep this Rumble trapped under tower, so he cannot impact my team, which is another mistake people make where, let's say I went to do walls right now, of course I can't, I don't know where they are, but just to give an example, and Rumble would have a timer to run mid and ult my team, that would be bad. I want him to respond to me, I want him to be stuck under tower, and then grow my lead. And here I'm not quite sure where the enemy is, so I'm respecting slightly, but of course Nocturne's uh, hovering me. So I can't really look to break the bot TF3 in this timer until I saw Wukong and Braum rotate. I saw them in the top river, so now I'm going to look to be a bit more aggressive under this tower. But as you can see, I'm not playing in a way where I'm overextending inside and I can die. But now that I see them on the map, I can play a bit more aggressive. You can pop W, look, uh, use it to break tower. Unfortunately, here he had stopwatch, he had proto values able to live. But now I'm in a position where I can afford death cap pretty soon. So I'm going to look to get that and come back onto the map. So coming back onto the map, the first thing I'm going to do, of course, eat this Krug camp. Because when you're in a position where you have two items, when you have Nashes and Riftmaker, you actually just completely one-shot camps. You do them so quickly, so you can afford to clear them on the way. But here I actually have three items, of course, even better. And the three-item timer on Gwen is a bit of a sign for you that you really want to be trying to force Baron. If Baron is not taken at this point, you are now scaled. You have three-item Gwen, you're extremely strong. Here I'm a bit more accelerated, but most of the time you'll be around level 16 when you hit three items for the most part. That's when you want to be fighting Baron, that's when you're at your strongest. Of course you still scale and you get stronger and stronger, but relative to the other champs in the game when you have three items, that is when you're most likely peaking if you're able to get death cap. So this is where I want to look to force Baron as soon as possible. So here I'm pretty sure I'm actually greeting to get level 16, of course my team is still behind. Keep this rumble trapped, farm as much as I can, and then I'm going to look to force Baron. So here, I might even base and run straight to Baron, yet that's exactly what I do, because I don't want them to get it. So I made Rumble answer me, I'm here first, and now I'm going to be looking to fight. I'm pinging, I want my team to go in, I want to start this fight. You see I'm hiding on this pink, I don't want them to know that they're fighting a 5v4. And then if they respect, which they are doing, looks like they're running town to Dragon, I'm going to be looking to force this Baron, because Gwen is one of the fastest Barons in the game, especially for a top laner, so you can utilize your 3 item spike to do it extremely quickly. And you can see just how fast this is going down, even though my Caitlyn is very weak. But now we're playing primarily for the fight. So uh, unfortunately there, I didn't space the Azir properly. I'll go back. It would be better for me. Of course, if I held my E better to dodge the Azir ulti. So I made a mistake in this fight. I needed to be very aware. And now you can see, I almost get, it almost punishes me. Here I should have E to dodge the Azir. You can see, he's pretty far away from me. I thought I wouldn't need to. But that's a mistake. But even though I get scooped in, I don't play this fight that well. I'm just so powerful, I'm able to completely one-shot them. And my team does great as well. But you can just see the ridiculous amount of damage that you have available to you as soon as you hit your three-item spike. And from this, we were able to get Baron and win the game. So you want to be playing extremely selfishly, but you want to be utilizing your lead to force Baron for your team at some point. Now, that when you want to do that, it depends on each game. Here... I wanted to do it around three items because my team was so weak. I needed to be the one that provides the Baron threat, the Baron damage, and also the one that carries the fight. Where if I tried to do this at two items, we would have lost completely. But it's going to depend. There are some games where maybe two item spike, you can force a Baron fight, or maybe two and a half with a Needless. It just depends. But in this game, when everyone on my team was quite far behind, except for my mid, I wanted to have three items and be as strong as possible before I force this, force this objective. 
Up next, we're going to be covering team fighting, and it's important to note before you team fight on Gwyn that she is one of the best front to back champions in the entire game. You want to be staying with your team and killing their tanks and their divers as they come in, which is why she's one of the best counter picks in the game. If you see a bunch of melee frontline that want to dive in, Gwyn is an exceptionally great pick. But in this game here, it's more realistic. I'm not in the luxury where I can verse five melees. I'm up against multiple range champs. They have a full build Draven top, fed Israel. Decently strong Zoe, but they have two divers, so it could be tempting for me to threaten the 16 kill Draven, but I know it's very unrealistic for me to burst him through Rakan's peeling. Instead, it's better for me to front to back with my team. So yeah, that's exactly what I want to be doing. I want to be shredding the Rel and the Rakan for my team before I dive onto the backline. So here, I'm waiting for them to go in, or I'm waiting for my team to go in first, because you don't want to be primary engaging on Gwen, of course, you have no real engage. So I'm waiting for the fight to break out, and then I'm going to be able to utilize my damage to shred their front line before I move on to the back line. That's what we're doing right now, a great stun by Syndra, and I'm pretty sure Rek'Sai starts this one out. But here, as you can see, it's open Nexus back against the wall, but I'm not overforcing. I'm pinging for my team to go in, because I know I can't be the one to engage, even though we're in the position where we could lose the game if a fight doesn't happen. And now, Rao engages straight away, and I want to be playing front to back. So here, I'm just getting CC'd by everything, unfortunate. And then I dash back, which was bad, but now I'm just completely shredding the front line. You can see the damage I'm doing to their frontline divers. I just completely one-shot them instantly, even though they're building full tank, and now I can move on to the backline. So you can see the difference, where if I went onto their backline straight away, left my backline to deal with their frontline, of course they wouldn't have been able to kill them. Rakan would have come back, peeled his backline off me, and it would have been very, I'd say, impossible for us to win this fight, but I knew my clear identity in this game. I knew I'm a front-to-back champion, even though they have very strong backline range threats, I need to do my job first before I threaten them. Now, although front to backing is going to be your default most of the time, there are some variables. Where in this game, they have a Singe and a Viego as their front line, and they have an extremely fed Cog Lulu. They have destroyed my bot lane, and I know that I don't really need to peel my Israel. He is playing Israel, he's self sufficient, and it's pretty hard for me to lock down and do any meaningful damage to Singe. Very fast, very easy for him to go in and out. Same with Viego. So, in this case, if I was to group up with my team and try to front to back, it'd be very hard for me to do any meaningful damage. Instead, in this game, it's better for me to pressure the back line. So here in this example, we have a good poke comp. They're sitting back poking. We don't really need to... They don't really need me to stay there and shred their front line. We don't need me to shred the singe. It's very hard for me to do so. He's not a tank tank, right? He's not a diver that's going to be going in. He just weaves in and out. You can see how fast he is. So it's actually better for me to threaten their backline in this situation. So here they have a Cog and Lulu, but if I run towards them, I'm just going to get completely one shot to get destroyed. So it's better for me to threaten them. So here, that's exactly what I'm doing. Shooting ulti from them at the side. And you can see here, I QE in, but now my W can't move anymore. So now I have to escape. I'm shooting ult at them, spacing them back and forth, making it hard for them to approach the fight and just completely wasting their time. And as you can see, they're trying to chase me down, but my champion with Ghost is very hard for them to stop. And now my team's actually been able to win the fight because their backline was unable to participate in this game. So keep that in mind. If you are playing not to play front to back, if you're threatening the backline, your job is not to necessarily kill them. Of course, if you're 10-0 and they're weak, you can, but for the most part, your job is to make it very hard for them to approach the fight. And now that we've won the fight, the fight is over. Now I'm still doing the same thing, spacing this Cogmore, and now we're actually able to kill him. So it's going to work out. You're going to have situations that come up where you're able to kill them in the end, but you just want to start out that fight dashing onto them straight away, especially if they have an enchanter that buffs them up. You're not really going to be able to do much. You're just giving them a free kill. It's better for you to threaten from the flank, but not actually commit. Now, the next most important thing, other than how to play out the fight on Gwen, is going to be your W usage. Your W is your key spell for team fighting, and I see a ton of Gwens use it in the first sign of combat. As soon as they're hitting a champion, they just put their W up, doesn't really do anything. Or if they see a skill shot about to hit them, they chuck up their W, when sometimes it's going to be best to hold your W for the right spells. We're here in this situation, Lee Sin goes in, and as you can see, she's hitting him. She's holding onto her W this whole time, of course, very good discipline. And even now, she's about to go in, Thresh chucks a hook, she's just dodging it with her movement. She's not committing her W, unless she absolutely has to, which is another point. You want to be dodging skill shots with your movement as well don't just rely on your w for everything a lot of times it's going to be better for you to hold it so even here he's popping ult he's dash forward he's still not used his w still queuing still holding onto it and now he's going to use it right he's dashing forward into this choke the kaiser is shooting him so now he's going to put up his w and he relocates it so kaiser can no longer hit him but you can see this whole time he was in combat he was not utilizing his w at all even when they're chucking skill shots even when people were hitting him until it was the perfect time to do so Next up, we're going to be covering Gwen's identity and the mindset you should have when playing this champion. And of course, we touched on it in the mid-game section, 
but you need to have a extremely greedy mindset. Your champion provides nothing to a team comp except for damage, you're not tanky, you don't have any CC, so you need to be as strong as possible. You need to have as many items as possible so that your damage is actually significant and your champion scales like a complete beast. So it should be a switch as soon as mid game started, that you want to be playing primarily to make yourself strong and in terms of farming as many jungle camps as you possibly can, which is a big reason. Why it's not good to play Gwen with a greedy jungler, you don't really want to be playing Gwen with Graves, because he also wants to be playing selfishly, it's best to play with a dog jungle, which can be like Sejuani or Zac, where they're fine to just give you as many camps as possible, but even if you're in that situation, you can still take camps, you can still take the enemy camps especially, and get yourself as strong as possible. And as for the second point, we will cover it in great detail in the drafting section, but Gwen is one of the best front to back champions in the entire game. Her identity is she is extremely powerful at front to back teamfights, she is a tank shredder, any HP stacking champion she can completely destroy. So if you're versus Renekton for example, even though he's not a tank, he's going to be stacking HP, core drink hysterics, you are going to completely shred him, or any sort of tank that dives into your team comp, you're going to be able to easily shred them down. Now there's also the flip side, where Gwen is extremely weak versus range champions. If you loan to a game and you're up against Koglulu, they have a Cassio or an Azir mid for example, Kindred Jungle, you are actually going to be completely useless I would say. Not useless, of course if you stomp your lane you can still have impact in the game, but in terms of everyone playing well in the game, your champion is not going to provide a lot if they have a high damage high range comp, so for the most part you want to be playing Gwen when you're up against melees that are diving into you. Gwen is also extremely powerful in the side lane, she can easily get prior, she can beat a lot of champions 1v1, and she also is a farm vacuum, you can power farm all the camps, all the waves on the map, and just grow your lead exponentially stronger, and you also have insane threat on the towers. Especially if you follow the rune section and you take Demolish, you're going to completely destroy the bot tier 2, bot tier 3, extremely quick, especially with Nash's tooth and Demolish, so you need to be using that strength. You want to be playing primarily in the side lane, and then using your side lane strength to help your team, not the other way around, not grouping mid, A ramming, helping your team, I'm worried my team's going to get caught out, I'm going to hover around them, Gwen is not the champion for that, you want to be playing for yourself and using your strength on the side lane. Next up we're going to be covering a full game example where I talk you through exactly what I was thinking throughout this entire game, and in this game I am playing Gwen up against Camille. Now although this is a Gwen sided matchup, Camille of course has insane gank setup so I do need a respect, which is why I ward level 1. Looking back I didn't really need to, I am up against Fiddlesticks, it's very unlikely he comes, but that's why I warded, and Camille even though this is Gwen sided, she wins 1v1 in isolation, you do have to watch out because if you do die to a gank or two, and she gets snowballed to Divine Sundra, this matchup is going to be in her favour, and now you may be thinking you could start E in this matchup to look for Dr. W, and of course I have tried that, the problem lies where if you skill E level 1, and the Camille skills Q instead of W, she is actually going to win the trade, so it's actually better and safer to start your Q and just secure push, look to punish her when she walks up, as you can see she doesn't really feel confident to walk up to CS without getting queued like that. And that's just basically what I'm looking to do, I'm looking to poke her down, crash my wave under tower, and allow the wave to come back towards me. Because it's very unrealistic that I can kill this guy level 1 to 3, but I do want to be trading onto him, I do want to get him low, so that once the wave is coming back towards me, he is in a vulnerable position. Now I did notice Fiddlesticks appeared in the bot jungle and I did crash my wave too late, so here because I crashed my wave late, I decided to clear wave 4 under tower and poke him at the same time, which is fine right, ideally you would be either cheater recalling or proxying, but because I know Fiddlesticks is in the bot jungle, I'm able to do that. So after I crash this wave I look to base and run back to lane, or maybe I'll even TP because I want the wave to come back towards me and I want to be in a position where I can punish him as he comes in. So most likely I'm going to TP, yep exactly because I crashed my wave too late, because I had to clear it under his tower, I didn't cheat, a, I didn't proxy sorry, so now I'm looking to TP so that I can allow the wave to come back in towards me of course, whilst also trading onto him like this and thinning the wave at the same time. So as you can see I'm not trying to queue too aggressively, I'm keeping my casters alive as I say that I queue onto him, I'm trying to force him to base, as you can see he still has more minions than me, so the wave is still going to come back towards me, I did slow down, the time in which it would take for the wave to come on my side, but it was worth it. I got a really good trade onto him, forced him to back in TP, and he's going to lose his cannon creep here, cannon XP as well. So now you notice the wave is coming back towards me, I want my Rek'Sai to punish this guy. It's very hard for me to kill him without level 6, I can't ghost him down, he'll just E away, which is why I'm pinging for my Rek'Sai. But Rek'Sai, I feel like a gank went poorly in the early game if I'm remembering correctly, and he's not coming, and now I have to do ring around the Rosie with this Fiddlesticks, which is quite annoying, I'm pinging Rek'Sai to come up. But it's solo queue, this is a great example actually, your jungle is not always going to be cooperative, and I'm able to just run around the circles against Fiddle, ask Rek'Sai what he's up to, and eventually he should look to come up. Right, I respected the fiddle gank, I'm giving him time to do whatever he wants to do, even if it's bad, he wants to do raptors, he wants to gank mid, that's fine, I'll, I'll just play accordingly and not die to this fiddle, but now I still want to hold this freeze, I don't want to let him crash away for free, which is why I'm still pinging, I'm very adamant that this is a key timer to punish this on, 
Well, it's not necessary. If Rek'Sai was on Raptors or Krugs, I would have just let it be. I wouldn't ping, but he's on topside already. I feel like this is a really good timer, which is why I'm wanting him to come. So here I get level 6 and dash onto him at the same time, pop my ulti and we get the kill. So you have to be patient, your jungler is not always going to match your timing exactly. Sometimes you have to play around that. It's more important if you have to choose to respect the enemy jungler than to set up your opponent's design. Because your champion is one of the best scaling tops in the game, so it's better to play accordingly. It's better to respect their jungle than to play super aggressive and expect your jungle to cover you in all, on, at all opportunities. So now heading back to lane, I am in a really strong position. I've got my tier 2 boots, I'm really snowboard, looking to push my lead even further. And I did go ninja tabby in this game, of course really good against Camille. Although they have an AP jungler, they have a Jace mid. If they had a Syndra mid for example, I probably would have not got my boots here. I would have rushed Riftmaker and got tier 2s later on, because I probably would have needed mercs. But of course Jace, Aphelios, Camille, tabby's going to be very valuable. And as you can see now, I'm sort of spacing the Camille. Because your E is going to give you extra attack range, which is why I utilized there. I dodged out her Q2 whilst also getting auto attacks onto her and I'm just looking to punish her as soon as she shows on my screen. I'm really strong at this point. She's double longsword versus tier two's and amp, so I'm in a really good position to punish. You can see she's sitting really far back and I'm just building a big wave. Now you want to be building a big wave so that you can utilize your demolish. You can proc demolish. As you can see, I'm running on the outskirts and even though she kicks me, it's not a problem. She doesn't do that much damage. She didn't get her sheen recall off. So now I'm just looking to build big waves, proc demolish. And if she walks up whilst I'm building my waves, I'm going to poke her. So pretty simple. In this position, the reason I don't want to be allowing the wave to come back into me and freezing per se, is because Rift Herald has spawned and also I'm up against Camille. Or if I freeze outside my tower, What's stopping you just from running mid, you know, E ulting my Yasuo and killing him and having high impact in this game when I can get an advantage against this guy regardless? However, if he was playing a champion that's not Camille, a high carry champion, can't think of one off the top of my head, maybe Kale, maybe I would let the wave come back towards me against Kale, try to punish her even further, but up against Camille, I can play for tower plates against her and the reason I don't want to freeze is of course, I don't want her to impact the map by playing for a herald or mid ganks. So there I took a tower shot for a trade, I wouldn't say it's worth it, it's better for me to take 100 zero trades, but it's fine, right? You can see as he went for that cannon, I got the true damage part of my Q, and now he's in a really bad position. So, able to snipe him down, I don't want to commit too hard with my E, I want to hold my E to survive that dive, and now I'm able to proxy and base. So I'm really far ahead at this point, the reason I was able to get that kill is because my game plan was essentially stack waves together, play for demolish proc if he tries to stop me from stacking waves, if he tries to stop me from proccing demolish, I'll hit my Q on him or if he tries to go up with CS. So pretty straightforward game plan, and this is going to apply in a lot of matchups. And now you can just see my advantage is growing bigger and bigger, level 9 to level 7. He's down 50 CS somehow, and now he's in a position where it's really hard for him to come back into the game. Now from this position, yet again, I do have an opportunity to allow the wave to come back towards me, but I'm not going to do that. I went through the reasons earlier. I don't want him to roam and have impact in this game. I can get my advantage regardless. You can see if he walks up to the wave, he's going to take an absurd amount of damage. And now we're just able to kill him for free, right? He's so far behind at this point. Quite easy for us to take him down. Actually a bit harder than it looks. But now we got him. So now I'm just going to be looking to break my tower as fast as possible. Where I see this mistake a lot. A lot of people make the mistake of trying to extend their lane. You know, maybe they'll base here and not try to break the tower. Because they want to keep punishing this Camille. But she's punished. She's level 9. She has 40 CS. She, my job is done. She's far enough behind that me making her 0-2 or 0-3 doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the outcome of the game. It's better for me to break this tower as fast as possible so that I can start impacting the map as fast as possible. Because if I try to roam around when the tier 1 is still up, he's going to get tower plates. It's actually better for me to break this tower as quick as I can and then look to roam around the map. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I probably could have broken it on that timer. Not sure why I didn't, but that's a general mindset. And now that's what I'm going to be doing. Stacking two waves together, breaking this tower, and then I can start to impact the mid game. I'll we'll speed it up a little bit. I'm guessing he's going to respect. And now he's going to give me the tower. So this is where I can impact the rest of the map. I've got a huge advantage over Camille, but as you can see, the rest of the map's not going so well. So now I really need to influence the rest of the lanes. Now normally at this point I would want to go straight back top out of base to stop Camille from getting plates, however they are playing quite aggressive bot, I do have a TP flank situation. So it works out quite nicely, and also in terms of the macro as well, because the next objective spawning, of course they just took the mountain drag, the next objective spawning is going to be Herald, so my job is to be on the opposite side of the next objective and create a numbers advantage. So even if you're bot quite early on and creating this advantage, it worked out quite nicely here because my bot lane actually died and I'm bot, which means they're going to go somewhere else. But be comfortable in this situation. Even if I'm answering a Felios Milio 1v2, that means my team is playing a 4v3, which is your main goal on strong side laning champions, is to create a numbers advantage for your team. 
And as you can see, I'm playing very aggressive, playing for plates, clearing the weight back here, and making them respond to me. If you don't respond to me, I'm going to get stronger and stronger. And as you can see, they have to. They send Milio and they send Fiddlesticks to answer me, which means now my team is playing a 4v3. And as you can see, it's working out quite well for them. They've got to pick on Jace, they've got to pick on Aphelios. They're actually playing it quite well from this point. Because I'm creating a numbers advantage, Fiddlesticks is not counter ganking, Milio is not protecting anyone, because they're busy answering me which is your main goal on Gwen, create numbers advantage whilst uh, maximizing your CS and XP. And now I even thought about basing because my team is basing. It's quite good if you can all recall at the same time, but I realize I don't need to. I'm full HP basically, high mana, and I can continue to pressure. I feel, feel strong enough that I can continue to create a numbers advantage. And that's exactly what happens. Milio and Aphelios answer me because Milio now, he just saw his Aphelios died by himself. So he's trying to protect him. And now my team's able to get another pick during this numbers advantage. So you can see here, I'm still pressuring. I'm making these guys answer me. If you don't, I'm going to be breaking your structures. And there's a lot of action going on mid. It's a sloppy two for two, you know, three for three, maybe. It's not quite in our team's favor, but I do not want to be a part of it. I want to be maximizing my golden XP. So they have to either answer me and create numbers advantage for my team, or they have to give me all that golden XP, right? So it's a win-win regardless, as long as you don't get killed on the side. You really have to master this line between drawing enemy champions to you, but not giving them the kill, right? Not letting them chunk you to one HP or kill you, but wasting their time to help your team play with a numbers advantage. Now on this deploy, I wanted to talk about a little bit. You'll notice I ran straight mid, even though I do want to be on the opposite side next objective, there's going to be situations we don't have time to create pressure before the objective is spawned. As you can see, the Herald is already up. If I went bot and Jace went to Herald, they would be 5 v 4 in my team. And here I'm feeling quite strong. I'm two items spiked. We're in the position where we could win a team fight, which is why I go mid. If you run straight mid, you are flexible. You can commit to the objective if a fight breaks out, or you can go back to side if the enemy's not contesting. And in this situation, the enemy didn't contest, so I went straight back to bot, answered this Jace, where ideally I would be top to be honest looking back, oh, I want to be on the opposite side and also I could be playing for top tier 2, but keep in mind my mid laner is playing Yasuo. Now Yasuo is also a very strong side laning champion, so it's not a situation where I feel extremely pressured to pull him away, make sure he's on the strong side. But he did actually end up being on the strong side, my team is playing to top, which is fine, my main goal is to create numbers advantage, right? Push this wave all the way in, make people answer, and either commit to a fight, that's a 5v4, or eat every single camp I can find. And as you can see, they are not answering, so you know exactly what I'm going to do. I am going to force you guys to answer me. If you don't answer me, I'm just going to blow up your entire base, so eventually they're going to have to. And you'll see Gwen had does insane damage to towers, especially with Nash's Tooth and Demolish. So these guys are just forced to recall and answer me, even though they just were in a position where they could win a fight. So here again, I want to be eating camps. This guy stole it, unlucky. And now Camille's bot. And I have to be really careful in this situation. So when the tier 2 is down, you have to be a bit more careful because it's quite hard to push all the way to tier 3, right? They can just run around that thick wall. It's quite dangerous because even though I've controlled the bot side of the jungle with their pink, they can just run around the wall if I push past this tier 2. So basically, I want to be sending waves after this Camille. And if I see him TP away or leave, I can either go for the tier 3 or look for a 5v4 fight like this. So exactly what, right, I'm looking to create numbers advantage, whether that be 4v3 or a 5v4. And this fight didn't go quite as well as intended, but it's still fine, right? If I didn't come to this fight, it would have been a lot worse because this was a 5v4. And keep in mind, my team, they're actually not behind anymore. It actually looks like they're catching up, but they're in a situation where they could lose a fight without me. And now I'm going to be looking to use my pressure to create a favorable situation for Baron. So around 19, 18 minutes, you should be having hearing warning bells in your head that Baron is going to be spawning soon because Baron is the game changing objective. You probably play a lot of games where you've been winning and the enemy team gets a Baron and you lose. Very common. And here, a fight breaks out, so I feel pressure to TPM and it works out quite well. So there, it's pretty rare that you'd be forced to TP into a fight as Gwen, but just from instinct, I knew it was going to work out quite well. It was a 1 for 0, which is fine, which is why I went for it. But now I want to be going straight bot as soon as possible. If you do commit to a play, which I'm not saying you're going to be playing sideline the entire game, you will commit to plays. Just make sure after you commit to it, you have a recall and go back to side or just run straight back to side as fast as possible. You don't want to be wasting any time running around thinking the fight might continue. You want to be farming as much as possible, pressuring as much as possible, and not just hanging around the you know, the outcome of a finished fight already. So now this is exactly what I'm doing, just hovering around bot, looking to create numbers advantage. There, Camille was answered me bot. This is a situation where we can 5v4, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So you can see the pattern, what I'm looking to do in the side lane, and it's very effective. 
My team was able to gain advantages for themselves 4v3, and we were able to win this fight 5v4. So it's a pretty strong pattern you can follow on Gwen, and there are a lot of variables. Of course, it's not as black and white as it looks in this game. Things just sort of worked out a lot better in this game than they would in across, you know, 100 games. This was a good one where my team actually utilized my pressure quite well. I'm not saying that's always going to be the case. I'm just saying in League, everyone is going to get caught out, right? Your teammates, your enemy teammates. But the more you can create a situation where you have your team has a numbers advantage, then of course the enemy team is going to get caught out a lot more. So now with our Baron, you may notice I'm calling for two lanes and pinging the bot jungle because I want my team to be playing mid and bot primarily and fully controlling the bot side jungle. And this is basically the throw prevention Baron macro where if I get ganked, my team's in the jungle, they can back me up and the same vice versa. If they get attacked, I can rotate to them because if someone's top, I'm not going to be able to run all the way across map and help them. They can't come and help me, so we spread too thin. I want to be playing two lanes. Now, this is where I make my biggest mistake in the game. I was kicking myself for multiple days after this, to be honest, where I'm trying to sync the waves up together, mid and bot, make them crash at the same time. However, I overextend, I play too aggressive, and I get killed by this fail stick ult. So my biggest mistake in the game, and it was really painful, but my team still got mid and bot it, so it's not the worst outcome possible. Just keep in mind, that Gwen is still quite vulnerable. You are a full damage champ. As you can see, I'm not happy about it. I've got Death Cap. I've got, you know, Nash's Tooth. I'm not really building any defensive stats. So keep that in mind. If they gank you with three or four people, it's very easy for them to one-shot you. So I'll skip to the final sequence of the game. As you can see, I'm still trying to play mid to bot, fully control, but my team gets caught out which is a result of me getting caught, of course, but I still have TP. If the fight continues, I can look to TP in because I'm strong enough at this point to change the outcome, which is what's happening. They're overextending, they're overcommitting, so I TP in, and then I'm looking to go on Aphelios first. Of course, in this situation, I don't need a front to back. I'm extremely powerful, and also they don't really have any frontline left, right? They had a Fiddlesticks, Jace comp, and Milia, no one's really a frontline. So in that situation, of course, you want to be flanking as well which is what I did, and now we're able to end the game. So the main takeaways from this full game example, in my opinion, is that I utilized wave control, allowed the wave to come back towards me to gain my early game advantage, and also I didn't tunnel on doing that the entire lane. Once I had my advantage, I was stacking waves, playing for tower plates, playing to Pokemon to tower, and that's going to depend on what matchup you're playing, but against Camille you can look to do so if you're ahead, but I'm mainly playing around the enemy jungler. I'm playing in a way that makes it so I'm unable to be punished by the jungler, apart from at the very end there, and I'm able to gain my advantage while whilst respecting at the same time. Now the mid game is the most important part in my opinion, because once I had my lead, I was deploying to the opposite side of the next objective most of the time, farming everything I possibly could, and just pressuring, creating numbers of advantage uh, constantly, making it either a 4v3 or a 5v4, and as you can see, in this game, luckily, every single time I created a numbers advantage, it did work out quite well, and in other games, that's not always going to be the case, but that is your highest chance of winning. I'll next one be covering drafting, so you know the best and the worst times to pick this champion, and in my opinion, out of all the guys I've made so far, this section is the most important for Gwen, because this champion can be the best champ in the game in certain situations, but completely useless if you're versus an absurd amount of range champs, so it's best to know when you want to be picking her. Now, as from jungle, this is the most important for your team. You really want to have CC and frontline. So champions like Sejuani are great, champions like Rel or Rek'Sai, and a common theme on these champs is also they have very low resource, which is also important, because in the mid game you want to be devouring every camp on the map that you can, and if you've got a Graves or a Lilia trying to eat all your farm, of course that's not going to help you get to where you want to be. And as for mid and AD carry, it actually doesn't matter too much, you can go one of two ways. You can either have a hyper range comp, so you can have an Azir and a Jinx for example, where they have to dive into you, or they're going to get poked out and then Gwen can chop them up. Or you can play a dive comp with it, you can play a Kali mid with let's say Samira or Azir or something, and you'll notice in the T1 finals game, they would, when they played Gwen, they played Gwen with a Kali, because it's fine, right? You can do a dive comp or you can play range, Gwen is quite versatile in terms of what carries you have on your team. The most important champions you want to play with Gwen come from jungle and support, where you really want to have champions that set you up, you want to have dog champs that will allow you to eat all their farm, and also champs with a lot of CC. So as from support, that's going to be champions like Rel, champs like Alistair are great, even Rakan. Basically, just dive buddies and frontline and CC is what you want to be receiving from jungle and support, but mid AD carry actually don't matter too much. And as for the champs you don't want to be playing with from jungle, it's of course going to be greedy farming junglers. So champions like Graves, champions like Kindred, not only do they not provide any CC or frontline for you, they're not going to allow you to do your damage, they're also going to be eating all of their camps even in the mid game. So it's going to be very hard for you to power farm every camp on the map if your jungler also wants to do that as well. Now as for a mid 80 carry, it actually doesn't matter too much. If I had to pick, 
champs I don't want to play with. With mid, it would be really weak early game champs. So champs like Kassadin, champs like Malzaha, where if they're versus a roaming champ like Teller, and he's able to push them under tower and constantly roam top, it's going to be very hard for you to scale or even play aggressive in your lane. So I'd stay away from having a hyperscaling mid with Gwen. And as for support and AD carry, it's going to be very similar. Actually, it's going to be a bit different. For AD carry, you don't want to be playing with AP champs. So you don't want to have Ziggs AD carry or Kafas, which is very rare. So for the most part, it doesn't actually matter. Or maybe even the Cogmore can be a bit of a problem sometimes if you have an AP mid as well. And as for support, it's going to be the same. You don't want to be playing with major support. So champions like Brand, that's pretty rare. Or even certain enchanters. Sometimes enchanters are good if you have a big beefy frontline from jungle. But if your jungler is playing a champion that doesn't provide frontline at all. And you have an enchanter support as well. can be quite tough for you. But for the most part bot lane matters at least. It's more important you're playing with a jungler that allows you to eat all his camps. But also sets you up for success in teamfights. Moving on to the enemy team, and the champs you do want to be versing, the champs that Gwen is good against, are going to be beefy frontline champs that want to be diving. So champions like Scion, champions like Set, really big HP stackers, they want to be running forward, or from jungle, champs like Sejuani and Jarvan, they basically are forced to go in. I guess they're not forced to, but their champion is best used diving forward, whereas Gwen is extremely good in front to back and shredding down these tanky frontline. Now as for mid, it's going to be champions that dive in of course, champs like Silas, it can be quite good, but also some range artillery mages that have longer cooldowns. So you don't want to be versing a ranged mage such as Azir, for example, where he has constant sustained damage, but it's really good against champs like Zoe or Lux, where they have really big damage spells, but it's very easy for you to block them with your W, and then while those spells are on cooldown, they're quite useless. Now, as for AD carry, it's going to be quite similar. Champions like Varus, champions like Jin, maybe not Varus right now, the tank version, version of Varus, quite hard to verse, but poke Varus in the past, or Jin or Ash, it can feel quite good because you can block most of their spells with your W. And as for support, it's also going to be beefy frontline champs like Nautilus or Alistair. Really good because they have to run forward, they have to engage onto your team most of the time, and then it's very easy for you to chop them down. And as for the champs you don't want to be versing from top lane, it's going to be champions that have a ton of threat onto you. So champions like Riven and Yone. Very easy for them to just dive onto you and burst you down, especially if they have follow-up. As for jungle, it's going to be ranged champions or divers. So champs like Graves or Kindred. I shouldn't say divers, I mean more so assassins. So Graves or Kindred. Very easy for them to kite you, or a champion like Kha'Zix, where it's very easy for him to ult into you, you know, auto QW, jump away, hard for you to really do anything against him. And as for mid, it's going to be range champs with sustained damage. So champions like Azir, Orianna, they can constantly pump out damage from afar, and if you utilize your W, as soon as your W is on cooldown, you're screwed, and even if you dive onto them, they do have a bunch of damage to get you off. And as for AD carry, it's going to be basically hyper carries with enchanters. Really don't want to be versing Cog Lilio, uh, Cog Lulu, Cog Milio, or Jinx Lulu, champs like that. You really want to stay away from that. Where most of the time, if you are wanting to pick Gwen and champ select, you're going to see either your jungler is playing a champ that sets you off for success, or the enemy jungle and support are doing so. You really don't want to be picking it early on into the draft, and then you see, oh damn, they pick Cog Lulu. My champion is now pretty useless unless I get very far ahead in lane. Most of the time, you want to be picking it into a heavy melee comp. Now we're going to be covering how to counter Gwen, how to play against this champion, and as for lane you have two options. You can either play a strong bruiser with a ton of all in, so a champion like Rumble, Pantheon or Riven, especially champions with Ignite, have a ton of threat on Gwen. You can use these champs to shut her down early, or you can play a ranged champion and just poke her down, because Gwen of course has no sustain in lane, so if you play a champion like Teemo, Kennen, even Kale, past 6 of course, you can look to bully her, chunk her lower and lower HP, and get her to the point where she can't trade onto you. Because Gwen's range is quite short, she can only really look to trade on a ranged champion with QE, but if you're spacing it quite well, it's very easy for you to get her HP lower and lower, and to the point where she's unable to lane against you. Now you may remember in the ability section of the guide, I touched on having a hyper focus on hitting the center part of your Q on Gwen. Hitting the center part on your Q will give you a significant boost in damage and also sustain, so the trade is a lot better. However, if you're playing against Gwen, you can play that the other side. We could have a huge focus on sidestepping the center part of your Q and not giving her that bonus damage, not allowing her to pop her passive. So keep that in mind. When you're versing Gwen, she's going to be trying to hit the center part, so you should be very aware if you're going to get hit by the Q, try to at least avoid the center part. You should also keep in mind, because Gwen is quite short range, she is extremely gankable, especially pre-level 6, so you should be trying to set up your wave, the position that sets up your jungler for their gank, to shut down this hyperscaling champion. And the reason you want to be coming pre-6 most of the time, is because even if you do kill her post-6, let's say for example you're playing Camilla Mukong, and even if you do kill her, of course it's going to be worth it, but she's going to ulti, She's going to Q, she's going to chunk you both down to low HP, you're both going to have to recall anyway, and that whole time they see Wukong spending all their time to kill Gwen top and recall, they know that they can play aggressive elsewhere on the map. 
where they can maybe gank bot, die bot. So you only really want to be taking these kills on Gwen pre-6 where your jungler is not going to get negatively set behind. But there are variables, right? Of course, if your jungler has nothing else to do, let's say your bot's playing Seraphine or Senna Tam or something, then of course it's fine to do so. Or if they're playing Kindred and they're not really going to take much damage. There are a ton of variables, of course. I'm just saying for the most part, heading into your game, you should at least be trying to set up the Gwen to be ganked at some point. And as for the final point, regardless of what champion you're playing, you need to have a ton of discipline in the mid game. You can't afford to just group mid on Orn, ulti, get one or maybe even two kills, and let Gwen blow up the bot tier 2, let her eat two bot camps, and just grow her lead further and further. You only really want to be dropping the bot tier 2 in a situation where your team's going to be getting a major objective. So a Baron, maybe even a Dragon Soul, an Elder Dragon, other than that you don't want to be giving Gwen this insane spike of gold. Now we're going to be wrapping it up with the main takeaways, the most important things for you guys to keep in your mind after watching this guide. And the first one is going to be, for lane, you do want to be initially playing for prior if you can, in matchups where you can do so, but you want the wave to come back towards you after you crash a big wave. So crashing a wave, allowing it to come back towards you, is the best way to play for solo kills on this champion, especially around the 5.30 minute timer when you're about to hit level 6. If you're level 6 with your ghost up, fresh by, full HP, and the wave is coming back towards you, there's going to be a great timer for you to punish your opponent. Now the second one, and this is probably the most important part about playing Gwen that a lot of people make this mistake for, but you want to be having a selfish mindset. I touched on it before, but you don't want to be sitting around mid, oh I'm worried about my team, they're going to get caught out. That's not really want to be how you play Gwen. Of course some situations you'll have to, if you're scared the enemy team's going to rush Baron of course, but for the most part you want to be using the side lane as a way to grow yourself stronger and stronger, make people react to you, and if you're unable to break tails in front of them, then use that timer to create a 5v4. You also need to have a huge focus and I would even say intensity of hitting the center part of your Q. Don't be satisfied, especially in lane, with just queuing your opponent hitting all the Q damage. You want to be reviewing your laning phase especially and making sure you're hyper focused. I want to be hitting the center part of my Q every single time because you're not going to be able to fine tune it by just throwing out Qs willy nilly, just hoping your champion mastery will improve. You really want to be focusing, I want to hit the center part of my Q, watch your opponent's movements and try to use your Q relative to what they're doing. And the final takeaway is you are one of the best front to back champions in the entire game, so make sure you're using it. Don't just let the enemy Renekton or the enemy Silas dive onto your backline for free while you're diving onto theirs. Use your strong front to back power to shred whoever's running towards your teammates, and then once they're dealt with, once you've taken them out, once you've snapped them in half, then you can look to deal with the backline. Alright everyone, I'm going to finish up, and one last thing, is if you're looking to add Gwen to your champion pool, of course I recommend doing so, she's a ton of fun and does have insane carry potential, I would just stay away from making her your most played champ, stay away from one tricking her or making her your main, unless she's the only champ you enjoy, because Gwen is really good in certain situations, she's one of the best counter picks in the entire game, but there's also the opposite, she's also very useless if you pick her early on in the draft, and it turns out in a certain way, so she's best using your champion pool as a counter pick in the situations where she has the highest impact.